good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our seminar this evening. My name is David Shankland. I have the privilege of being chairman of the society. And uh, we are very pleased to welcome uh, this evening uh, Professor Curry to give us um, a, a paper. Now, Professor Curry is um, a specialist in the transformation of mystical, religious, and intellectual movements in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, is particularly uh, fascinating on this topic, as we've already had a chance to learn in our little chat before the seminar, and I'm sure he'll be very pleased to talk about this more in, 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 in general when we come to the end. But um, for this particular paper, he's very kindly sh sharing some specialist research that he has done on uh, uh, pirates uh, in the early modern age. And I think this is an absolutely fascinating topic. One occasionally comes across books describing the way that that, that pirates occasionally uh, avoided being hanged and gradually uh, uh, became distinguished uh, men of the society from which they which they uh, uh, emerged, and so they can somehow uh, trans transform themselves from brigands into into statesmen, and um, it's absolutely wonderful that we have such an example uh, to to talk about this evening. Um, so I think that the best thing to do is just uh, say, uh, please, um, uh, uh, John, the floor is yours, and we look forward very much to your presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, th thank you, David. Um, and it's funny you should uh, mention this in your remarks, because at the beginning of this year, I gave a variant of this uh, talk of a shorter version to a conference called The Problem of Piracy, uh, that basically examines these phenomena worldwide from China to the Americas, and in my case, North Africa and the Ottoman Empire, and uh, trying to sort of determine, um, you know, the differences between pirates, corsairs, grand admirals, and the like, uh, can sometimes get a little bit more tricky than we'd like. Um, and uh, this uh, particular figure, um, I think, will very much reflect the remarks that you made there. Um, the person I'll talk about today is a man named uh, Mezumorta Hussein Pasha, um, who uh, comes into the historical record primarily as a corsair tied to um, the city of Algiers in North Africa, and who works his way up to become the third day of Algiers um, in the 1680s, uh, and then ultimately uh, is tapped to become the Ottoman Grand Admiral um, through a series of both career reverses in North Africa um, and uh, reverses of the Ottoman Empire on the battlefield during the Great Turkish War of 1683 to 1699. Um, and so I'll try to introduce Meza uh, overall uh, life trajectory and how this sort of fits into the world of the late 17th century Mediterranean, um, which was a very uh, destabilized environment. And ultimately, I'm going to argue that Mesomorta um, played a much bigger role in Ottoman history than he's ever been credited for, and that that role has been overshadowed by the Ottoman Turkish defeat um, in the long Turkish war uh, of the uh, late 17th century that led to the uh, Treaty of Karlowitz and the ceding of Ottoman territory um, in Eastern Europe. So, Hopefully, I should ask before I begin, can everyone see the sort of changes in animation on the slide? Is everything working okay? Well, I can see the, the blue slide, which has prelude historiographical changes of the Corsair era. Okay, then is, is there working. a... Yeah, okay. okay, it's working, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure, because sometimes I've done this on Zoom before, and when I switch slides, it just stays frozen on the first one. So I just wanted to check. So uh, thank you for that. And I'll uh, launch into this with a, a bit of a prelude about uh, you know how I myself got into this, because as David had mentioned, uh, I am not primarily a historian of naval matters or of corsairing or of uh, Ottoman Grand Admirals. Um, I primarily study uh, Islamic mysticism in the Ottoman context, and in particular, the role of uh, Sufi religious orders um, in the Ottoman 
political, social, um, and economic scene. Um, and so I came around to this figure uh, through a second book project I've been working on for quite some time on a Sufi order um, in uh, the Asian side of Istanbul in the suburb of Uskadar, uh, known as the Nasuhi Sufi order, which was founded in the late 17th century and uh, which uh, came down through a family line until the, uh, uh, the last sheikh passed away in 1934. And in the course of researching the foundation of the order, um, it became clear to me that the turning point that allowed this to move from being sort of just a local pious figure in a neighborhood community uh, to a major religious order um, in the Ottoman capital uh, was the support of this Ottoman Grand Admiral Mezumorta Hussein Pasha, um, who recognized the sanctity and saintly uh, credentials of Nasuhi Effendi, the uh, founder of the order. Um, and then uh, subsequently uh, went ahead and uh, uh, gave large donations um, to uh, the Sheikh and his followers to sort of establish uh, the kind of infrastructure that would make it uh, uh, more than a uh, uh, just a local order um, in the community. And so this raises questions for me. Um, who was Mezumorta to begin with? Um, and why would he abruptly decide to elevate what was a minor and quite frankly failing Sufi order at that time into uh, the kind of major player on the religious scene that it would later become? So it was through these questions that I got drawn into digging deeper and then deeper and then even deeper and then falling into a rabbit hole of uh, just exactly who Mesomorta was, where he came from, and why he might have taken this course of action. Uh, and in the process, what I discovered is that he is a lot more than just the sum of these parts. Um, and in fact, a figure who probably deserves a lot more interest and recognition than he's gotten up until now. Uh, to give you some background on how Ottoman naval history has primarily been presented up to this point, most scholars of the Mediterranean and Ottoman history have focused primarily on the great 16th century naval figures. Um, people like Hayrettin Barbarossa, um, Turgut Rais, um, and other great captains of the 16th century that expanded the Ottomans naval range across the Mediterranean and North Africa and even into uh, places like the French ports through alliances with France during the 16th century. Um, but the literature on this uh, particular period, um, while um, often uh, quite helpful in this regard, usually just abruptly cuts things off after the Battle of Lepanto and sort of sees subsequent Ottoman naval efforts as uh, not particularly worth discussing or just simply uh, they don't move into that period as it creates you know, a different set of issues that they have to confront. The few studies that do look at the 17th and 18th century period often frame the discussion uh, through the issue of captivity and ransom uh, of captives, uh, both Christian and Muslim uh, during the period. Uh, and what you uh, often see uh, is that they, they put the focus on how the various captives um, that were languishing in North African cities were ransomed by various organizations and then ultimately uh, brought back um, to uh, Europe. And occasionally you get a study that looks at it from the other side, how were Muslim prisoners redeemed and brought back to uh, Muslim land. Uh, but this seems to be the dominant concern, and you only sort of learn about these other issues in passing, um, uh, and uh, often as sidebars to the primary discussion. Furthermore, tracking a figure like Mesomorta, um, whose uh, appearance in the historical record ranges from Tunis to Algiers, to Spain, to France, to Venice, to uh, uh, the Aegean Islands and Greece, to uh, the various parts of the Ottoman Empire and Egypt, um, it requires a lot of intersectional tracking. 
Um, it requires a far greater command of languages than even I could muster. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, often the references are you know, minimalist. You have to really go digging around um, in the archival record to sort of find them buried in tomes that primarily focus on other issues. So there's a bit of frustration in running all of this down. And I have to admit uh, by way of a caveat and tour here uh, that I, there's no way I've looked up all the uh, possible references that may exist in some of the sources. My knowledge of the Venetian sources is especially uh, weak and I'm trying to get in touch with some people who do Venice to see if they can help me out here. Um, and then finally, the Corsairs have a somewhat independent nature. Um, they don't tend to do things um, in a way that uh, necessarily seems to be part of a broader pattern. They often act on the moment, and it's sometimes difficult to distinguish just what exactly their motivations were at a given time or place. And since they often did not pen uh, extensive works in their own right to inform us of their own thinking. Um, we have to kind of piece this together from things they might have said that got picked up by other sort of broadcasters that happen to be in the environment. And we'll see quite a bit of this um, in this presentation. Uh, so this being said, we have to look at the background of the 17th century and the emergence of figures like Mesomorta, Hussein Pasha. Um, and the key issue here is to recognize that starting in the late 16th century, and especially during the period of about the 1590s, um, the Ottoman Empire, and indeed the wider word, world more broadly, uh, was hit by a pattern of various kinds of environmental crises, um, the most prominent of which was uh, what's called the Little Ice Age, or what uh, Hugh Trevor Roper has called the uh, general 17th century crisis, um, which led to much reduced harvests, um, a sort of decline in stability throughout many regions of the world, um, and a migration of populations. And in the Ottoman Empire, this often meant populations in rural areas at higher altitudes down to lower ones because agriculture became impossible to manage uh, from the early 17th century onward in many of these regions. And what makes this important for our purposes is that the destabilization caused by these environmental crises um, basically drove a upsurge in various kinds of uh, uh, corsairing activity uh, in the Mediterranean and elsewhere. And you begin to see uh, a lot of these people who have uh, been displaced or destabilized uh, trying to find employment in uh, any kind of way they can, and some of them will go and sign up on ships. And you sort of see uh, the Ottoman Navy go from being sort of an instrument of Ottoman military power uh, to one that's sort of competing uh, with various kinds of localized corsairing groups um, that begin to simply uh, raid whoever they can for their own survival. Uh, and into this picture also comes the phenomenon of what's called the renegados, um, who are uh, basically European pirates uh, who eventually switch sides because they feel they get a better deal from working with the North African Corsair states. And in the process, they introduce new kinds of technology from the Atlantic world, such as uh, various kinds of square rigged sailing ships, um, that have a much greater range and speed and effectiveness uh, in carrying out various kinds of grading activities on the high seas. And it's in some ways a little known fact uh, that by the mid 17th century, these fleets, um, be they uh, staffed by either renegados or uh, uh, native born uh, Muslim sailors like Mesomorta, um, they had a range where they could uh, raid areas as far afield as Iceland and even the Newfoundland fisheries um, at one point. Uh, 
Um, so these uh, uh, characters uh, really had an extensive range and were viewed as a uh, major threat uh, to shipping not only in the Mediterranean, but throughout much of the Atlantic uh, during the destabilized period of the 17th century. And we know that in the Western Mediterranean alone, the Corsair activity records seem to have doubled um, over the course of the first half of the 17th century, sort of reflecting this upsurge in more people getting in on the act. Now, as for the North African uh, various city-states that were increasingly dependent on this corsairing activity, uh, we have to keep in mind that in addition to the environmental problems that circumscribed their land-based agricultural production during this period, they were also subject to an influx of continuous refugees from Spain. Uh, from the 1500s onward as a result of the prescribing of Muslim and uh, Jewish practices um, in that part of the world from that point forward. Um, so these cities were often uh, a sort of uh, uh, lumping together of uh, local peoples who had always done this kind of thing with an influx of new populations that often had to seek out employment however they could find it, and often served as a ready force to reinforce these corsairs. By the mid-17th century, however, uh, many of the uh, European states of the period had begun to develop effective enough naval presences in the Mediterranean that they were able to at least circumscribe some of this corsairing activity. Um, and uh, it did not help that the Ottoman linkages with the cities, which had always been kind of nominal and limited to begin with, was disrupted by political conflicts, um, especially in 1656, uh, when the Ottomans uh, basically got into a fight uh, with the uh, Janissary leaders of Algiers and basically cut them off for five years and refused to allow them to recruit any more Janissary soldiers from Asia Minor until they uh, 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 gave the Ottomans uh, uh, what they had wanted. And uh, one of the byproducts of this conflict and the sort of being cut off from further Janissary recruitment is that the remaining Janissaries uh, began to uh, uh, work more closely with the various Corsair captains to sort of form a mixed elite uh, to sort of reinforce their numbers and sort of address the problem of recruitment. Um, and by 1671, this led to the emergence of a new kind of leadership position known as the Daya. Um, or as we would know it in English, the Day of Algiers. Um, and uh, the Daya was sort of envisioned as kind of like a, uh, a person who would be the governor of the city um, and its fleets and its hinterlands uh, as uh, sort of the local representative um, and who would usually have only a nominal allegiance uh, to the Ottoman Sultan. So by 1671, many of these uh, city-states in Algiers, Tunis, and elsewhere um, had these kinds of local leadership figures who were often the real authorities in the region and who had only sort of a nominal uh, allegiance to Istanbul. And it's into this kind of world that's emerged in the 17th century uh, that a figure like Mezumurta Hussein Pasha would have been born uh, and uh, which he would have learned his trade and his craft. So we have to kind of keep this in mind as we uh, delve into the details of his early life. And trying to figure out his early life is a real cipher. And in fact, after researching it thoroughly, I've come to the conclusion that much of what we thought we knew about it is actually wrong. Um, if you read the Encyclopedia of Islam entry from the second edition uh, on Mezaborta, um, he's described as a Christian convert from the Spanish island of Mallorca. Uh, and uh, this is uh, sort of ultimately derives from an account 
by a uh, consul named Aubrey de la Montrier, um, uh, who was in uh, Istanbul uh, for a while in the 18th century. Um, this sort of suggests that Mesomorta was an example of these kinds of renegados um, that I was talking about. Um, but the more I sort of delved into it, the more I realized that this was probably not true. Um, this was probably based more on hearsay and assumptions uh, by Aubrey de la Montrier rather than uh, uh, the uh, actual uh, reality of Mesomorta himself. Uh, another French consul, one who was resident in Algiers and who had actually met Mesomorta as part of his duties, um, instead located his origins in Istanbul um, and sort of framed him as a sort of Turkish Ottoman Muslim in origins, uh, who later, you know, ended up uh, in Algiers as a corsair. Um, this was a bit closer to the mark, but after digging around a bit more, I've come to the conclusion that probably Laurent Darvaux uh, was uh, uh, perhaps misinformed or misunderstood his sources as well. And the best account of his origins probably comes instead from a Moldovan voivode um, who was often resident at the Ottoman court uh, in the late 17th uh, century, uh, a man named Dmitri Kantemir. And as part of his lengthy history of the Ottoman Empire, he has a very long involved footnote uh, that describes uh, Mesomorta's role in the Imperial Navy. Uh, and as part of that discussion, he said that he originally had come from the African city-state of Tunis. Um, and so therefore he was born a Tunisian. And uh, this, account seems to square best with the way Mesomorta's career unfolds um, uh, from this point forward. Uh, so uh, he's probably ultimately a Tunisian who learns the craft of corsairing um, as part of his early life in Tunis, um, and then sort of moves back and forth from the various Mediterranean ports and ultimately settles in Algiers as the best place to practice his trade. Now, some of you may have noticed just this name Mesomorta is not a particularly normal Turkish name. And those of you who might know a bit of Italian may have recognized the possibility that this is a resemblance to the Italian Mezzomorto or half dead. And you would be right. That is exactly what it means. His nickname and you know, the way in which he was often known in the corsairing world was Mezzomorta um, or the half dead one. And the nickname comes according at least to Cantemir from the fact that when he was a young man, um, he was cornered by a Spanish uh, fleet um, while corsairing, uh, defeated in battle and grievously wounded in the encounter uh, to the point where it was not sure that he was going to recover. He eventually did so, uh, but spent you know, somewhere north of a de decade in captivity uh, in a Spanish prison before he uh, somehow escaped or was redeemed and was able to return to ca captivity. And uh, Dimitri Cantemir uh, then concludes that account by saying, at which point he continued to do grievous damage to us Christians. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this seems to be the sort of minimalist narrative of his origins that we've been able to um, uncover. And furthermore, Hussein, Mesomorts of Hussein Pasha, um, is a uh, figure who clearly identifies primarily as a corsair, because when we look at uh, Dmitri Kantemir's account, he includes a lengthy quote about the way in which he conducted himself at the Ottoman court once he had become a grand admiral uh, at the end of his life. And uh, I won't uh, read out the entire uh, quote here. Um, uh, uh, many of you can probably sort of skim along with it here, but I'll bring your attention to several points. Uh, one is that he always refused to take off his sailor's clothing and dress in sort of the traditional fancy garb of the Ottoman court. 
uh, which everybody else was doing. And sort of the other Ottoman port members would always try and get him to uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, stop doing this and sort of say, look, you got to come to court in a proper robe and sable jacket and all that. And, uh, you know, in other sources, I found that the Sultan even gives him like, you know, uh, royal sable coats and things like that uh, as sort of a traditional gift giving to high level officials. But he would never wear them, you know, he was just come dressed as a sailor. Um, and then when they tried to pester him about this, you know, he had this remark uh, where he always said, uh, you know, uh, he made the honor of the vizier bestowed on him by the sultan to consist not in dress, but in bravery. And he would show how much the most slovenly men excel the best dressed ladies. And uh, I cannot stress enough how incendiary and insulting this remark probably would have been uh, to the high level members of the Ottoman court, um, which suggests that this is not a sort of typical figure um, in that kind of context. This was not somebody who sort of uh, uh, came into this position and then sort of affected the uh, manner of a sort of nouveau riche type. He was always a sailor, remained a sailor, and demanded that he be uh, you know, respected uh, for this. And unusually in the context of the time, he was able to do this, um, as we will see. So this all being said, what happens when we begin to get more solid references to a figure like Mezumorto Hussein Pasha in the historical record? And uh, the first surviving actual record that we can accurately locate a Mesomorta Hussein uh, popping up in the uh, record is in 1674 uh, with the uh, extensive uh, uh, autobiographical accounts of uh, uh, the consul to Algiers, Laurent de Arvaux of France. And in 1674, he leaves a lengthy notice about his involvement um, in a uh, incident known as the Picotti incident that sort of draw, drew him into a diplomatic series of problems uh, with the Algerian rulers um, in 1674. And as part of this diplomatic um, imbroglio, uh, he uh, notes the uh, central role of a figure he calls Hussein Rais or Captain Hussein, a corsair who served under the first day of Algiers um, and uh, uh, who played a major role in the incident. Um, so what was the incident? Well, basically it was one of these things that was all too common in the Mediterranean diplomacy and the sort of destabilized world of the time. What had happened was that 20 French pilgrims had boarded a Genoese ship captained by a man named Niccolo Piccati, uh, to take them from Marseilles to Rome for uh, official ceremonies and celebrations of the Catholic Church in Rome. And so these ships picked up the French travelers and began traveling and uh, got to uh, the area around Genoa uh, and then came out from the port where they encountered a ship flying a Dutch flag. And Nicola Piccati, you know, sort of said, well, you know, we don't necessarily have hostile relationships with the Dutch. Um, and even if they stop us and they decide they don't like that we have the French who they're, you know, have conflicts with at the moment, um, we'll just, you know, turn over these Frenchmen to them and go on our way. It won't bother us. But what he didn't know is that this Dutch flagged ship was actually the flagship of Mesomorto Hussein Pasha, who was flying the flag as a deception. And when the ships got close, he promptly dropped the charade, captured the ships, and packed them all off to Algiers, you know, for the usual corsairing ransom. And so at this point, Laurent d'Arvo got involved because basically the day of Algiers and Louis XIV had a treaty in force where they were not supposed to be attacking each other. And while Mesomorta had technically not attacked a French ship, but a, a Genoese one, um, he still now had these French uh, people in his uh, custody um, that should not be targets of war. And so Laurent d'Arvaux uh, 
uh, basically got involved to get them released because, you know, it's violating the treaty. But in his own words, he complained these French travelers were, you know, basically, uh, you know, stupid, silly people who said all the wrong things when they were captured uh, and basically led the day of Algiers to believe that they were in league with the Knights of Malta and other crusaders in the Mediterranean that were the enemies of the Algerians. And so instead the day accused the French of basically violating the agreement in their own right and demanded very high ransoms for the captives, which may or may not have been uh, an accurate reflection of their feelings as much as a way to squeeze more money out of the consul. The upshot of all this is that most of the French were eventually released. Uh, but uh, uh, in the process, uh, it proved uh, you know, very difficult to unravel the whole thing. And as far as Mesomorta went, what makes Darvo's memo memorials uh, interesting uh, is that he describes you know, uh, Mesomorta as being sort of like the only honorable person in the whole affair. Um, he basically said, you know, Mesomorta came to me, he sort of apologized for the whole thing and said he'd do what he could to sort of help get us out of the whole mess. And, uh, you know, if it weren't for the day being so intransigent, I, I think he probably would have been, you know, quite capable of doing this. And he also noted that for a Corsair, you know, this was an unusually pleasant and nice man and not like the other people in his profession. He then noted Hussein Rais a second time a few years later, as someone who was not corsairing, but escorting various French and Levantine merchants um, with an armed escort uh, to basically complete trading missions between the French port of Marseillais um, and various ports in the Middle East. And he reflects with great pride in his memoirs uh, about how uh, pleased he was that the uh, Marseille authorities gave Mesomorta such a uh, wonderful reception and treated him with such honor. And he said, this, this really makes us look good um, in the context of the Mediterranean world. So we can see here Mesomorta could wear many hats. He's not necessarily just a corsair or somebody to be feared, but somebody who could also be hired to carry out various missions and honored as a sort of useful adjunct to Mediterranean commerce. So not exactly the picture of the bloodthirsty pirate that we're used to getting um, from sort of more popular sources here. Nevertheless, events like the Picotti incident and also the reluctance of Louis XIV to release many of his Muslim prisoners who were being used as galley slaves in his own neighbor, in, in his own Navy, uh, basically led to an outbreak of conflict and the, the breaking of the treaty with Algiers um, in the early 1680s. And to respond to this, Louis XIV sent um, his Admiral Abraham Duquesne, uh, along with the French Navy, on a punitive expedition uh, against the Algerians um, for the violations of the treaty and the sort of uh, uh, abandonment of it uh, by the Algerians after 1680. And uh, Duquesne came armed with new technology at this point. This is one of the first Mediterranean battles that was fought with what were called bomb vessels, uh, in which the French ships were equipped kind of with mortar cannons that could launch shells from a long distance at sea um, into land-based targets, uh, which was something that the Algerian city-states had not yet encountered before. And uh, this sort of led to some consternation on the ground. Uh, the second day of Algiers, a man named Hassan Baba uh, was ruling at the time and was caught off guard by the size and scope of the French expedition and also their ability to indiscriminately bombard uh, the city. And so to temporarily bring a halt to this and try and figure out a way to sort of ex extricate himself from the immediate predicament for which he was not immediately prepared, um, he proposed sending several hostages 
um, to the French flagship while they worked out an arrangement that would uh, restore some kind of peaceful restoration of relations. And one of the people he sent was none other than Mazamorta Hussein Pasha. Uh, and there seems to have been some backstory to this after I went digging around a bit. And it was that uh, Mezumorta, as part of traditional Corsair practice during this time, had a Janissary minder on board his ship whose orders he was supposed to obey in various circumstances. And during one raiding voyage, he had apparently not been particularly good at taking orders from the uh, Janissary uh, representative. And when he got back to port, the Janissary representative complained about him to the day. And so the day had him punished by uh, being bastinadoed on the feet uh, 500 times, uh, which could not have felt particularly good um, and also probably left him with a good deal of resentment. Uh, so sending off this kind of a figure to uh, the French as a hostage uh, probably was a reflection of Hassan Baba's understanding that he was not a particularly popular figure um, with this particular individual. This proved to be a mistake on Hassan Baba's part, because when Mezumorta got on board the ship, he basically told Duquesne and his men, look, I'm going to tell you something. Hassan Baba has no money. He's claiming he's going to get up a sort of ransom payment for you uh, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get this thing resolved. But he, what he's really doing is stalling for time. And I'll tell you what, if you let me go, I'll get rid of him. And I'm a fairly wealthy man, well-connected. I'll get everything, you know, raised for you in a day, and we can settle this very quickly, you know, and be done with the whole thing. And so Duquesne kind of said, hmm, no, well, this is interesting. We might as well give it a try. We're starting to run low on supplies anyways, and we would like to end this quickly. So he took a chance and let Mesomorta go. And that proved to be Duquesne's mistake, because Mesomorta promptly did exactly as he said. He went and basically got together a group that overthrew Hassan Baba, who was struggling to raise funds to pay the, uh, uh, the fine. And uh, then he sent a messenger to Duquesne that said, okay, I'm now in charge now. Uh, you should just go ahead and leave because I'm not going to pay you either. And I'm much more competent as a sailor than, than Hassan Baba is, and uh, I know you're running low on supplies. And uh, so at that point, Duquesne was absolutely furious and uh, simply started bombarding the city indiscriminately with his remaining stocks of shells. And so in response to this, Mesomorta packed up the local French representatives uh, starting with Jean Levesque, who was sort of the major figure on the ground who was ransoming captives at the time, and loaded him into a cannon and then shot him out at the French fleet as a way of basically saying, you're going to stop this indiscriminate bombing of my city, or I'm going to start shooting your people out at you. And we know from reading the correspondence in retrospect um, that this was a way of Mesomorta uh, announcing his displeasure with the indiscriminate bombing of, uh, of civilians um, in Algiers. Um, as he said um, in his messages to the French Navy later on, I don't mind if you come in here and attack my cannon or my fortifications or my military forces. That's part of war. But if you start blowing up my civilians, markets, and mosques indiscriminately, I'm not going to show any respect for your people either. Um, and uh, this uh, French uh, uh, sort of illustration of a subsequent uh, engagement between the Algerians and, Mesomor and Mesomorta and themselves in 1688 um, sort of shows in the background how you know, the indiscriminate bombing attacks um, really did uh, damage Algiers. And it's been estimated that probably a third of the population had to flee into the hinterlands to sort of seek safety while these bombardments were going on. Uh, so Mesomorta was not particularly amused by this. He viewed it as dishonorable. And in fact, he registered this displeasure by refusing to actually deal with Abraham Duquesne, the chief admiral 
And he would only talk to them through a sort of low ranking subordinate named Dusso. And so all the, all the correspondence from him preser preserved in the French archives, uh, basically uh, uh, more or less uh, is addressed to Dusso and Duquesne is not even mentioned in any of them. Um, so we can uh, get a real sense for how Mesomorta, uh, you know, sort of viewed uh, the use of this new weapon and uh, the ways in which he responded to this. Uh, but in the end, despite multiple engagements from 1682 to 1688, where the French tried to bombard Algiers into submission, um, Mesomorta always waited them out in a kind of stalemate and forced them to retreat. And after 1688, despite the French trying to sort of present this in the official propaganda as a victory um, over the Algerians, um, basically the French had to sue for peace and send an Algerian representative home with a lot of freed galley slaves and gifts for Mesomorta. Um, and uh, when Mesomorta learned that the French had taken this course of action because the campaigns were getting too expensive and they needed to direct their attention to other conflicts in Europe, um, he sort of responded with, well, if that was all they cared about, then I could have burnt the city down myself for half of what they spent, you know, sort of demonstrating sort of the sense of humor that these corsairs could sometimes have about these matters. So this is sort of the Algerian background uh, to Mesomorta, who had through sort of various accidents of fate ultimately been elevated to the third day of Algiers and had become a major political as well as a sort of corsairing figure uh, by the 1680s. But there's also things going on elsewhere in the Mediterranean that are going to intervene in his career trajectory. And one of these was the outbreak of the Great Turkish War from 1683 to 1699, and also the outbreak of a sort of sub-conflict in that broader war known as the Morean War, in which the Venetians decided to pile on to the Grand Alliance against the Ottomans in Eastern Europe uh, by attacking Ottoman possessions in Greece and the Aegean from 1684 onwards. And the Morean War began when Mesomorta was still sort of going back and forth with these French intervals of treaty and conflict throughout the 1680s. And so he could not really be directly drawn into it right away. Um, and in fact, uh, by 1685, the initial Venetian victories and conquests of various uh, Greek ports uh, led uh, uh, you know, the Sultan to dash off letters to Mesomorta, demanding that he equip uh, fleets of uh, uh, 10 to 20 uh, ships with Corsairs that could be used to help the Ottomans with the defense of the Eastern Mediterranean against these Venetian incursions. Um, however, Mesomorta uh, basically refused uh, to get involved, or at least he didn't do much to help out. And there were two reasons for this. One was the aforementioned conflicts with the French, but the other was that he kept launching expeditions against his likely native Tunis, um, trying to sort of draw Tunis into the orbit of uh, the day of Algiers. Um, and at one point, the Sultan sends a sort of very annoyed letter to Mesomorta, basically saying, uh, look, you're in Tunis sort of bombarding the city and sort of plundering the area. Um, this is not helpful to my campaign against the Venetians. Please stop and uh, end this and give me some help instead. Um, so clearly Mesomorta you know, had some North African ambitions and was not necessarily focused directly on Ottoman affairs during this time frame. It was only when peace was reached with the French representatives after 1688 uh, that the Ottoman option really began to come into view. Um, it seems that the Sultan tried to issue an order to have Mesomorta come to Istanbul to become the Grand Admiral uh, early in 1689, 
But because negotiations with the French were still proceeding, Mesomorta and the Janissaries that followed him sent a sharply worded missive back to the court saying, uh, we kind of are preoccupied here. Could you please postpone this? And so the Sultan grudgingly did um, at the time. That being said, when peace was finally signed with the French in the middle of 1689, this ironically proved to be Mesomorta's undoing um, in the overall uh, 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 state of affairs at the time. Because in order to secure peace with the French, one of the concessions Mesomorta had to make was to renew the former treaty, basically making French shipping off limits for Algerian corsairs. And it seems from the correspondence and observations at the court um, that basically Mesomorta was giving away too much of the store for the taste of some of the Janissaries and Corsairs. And on October 4th, an English representative sent back a uh, message to home uh, informing uh, the English that, uh, uh, that there was a rebellion taking place in Algiers and that Mesomorta was quickly dethroned a day later and forced to flee uh, in a ship um, and leaving apparently his entire family behind under the protection of a local Sufi mystical leader. Um, and this, I would argue, might be the reason why he later has these strong Sufi ties, at least in part. Interestingly, before I sort of proceed to the next stage of uh, Mesomorta's career, the illustration you see here is sort of the sole surviving uh, picture that we actually have of Mesomorta as a person. And we have it through the most interesting and unlikely of sources, which is a German engraver uh, named uh, 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 Matthias uh, Wolfgang, uh, Andres Matthias Wolfgang. Uh, who, who basically was enslaved in Algiers from 1684 to 1687. Uh, and uh, as a result of this, because he was an engraver who had been captured trying to travel to England to learn more about the craft, um, he apparently was able to make all these illustrations of uh, his life in captivity. And because he had met the day as part of his being a slave that served, in his words, chocolate coffee uh, to the various dignitaries at the Algerian court, um, he was able to sort of give us this uh, picture of what, uh, you know, the day of Algiers uh, looked like um, at the time in uh, formal dress. And here we see Mesmorta was probably not averse to formal dress, uh, at least in part, um, as part of his uh, responsibilities as uh, day. So what then happens when Mesomorta is, in, is ignominiously packed off into exile? Uh, well, first, ironically, he flees to Tunis, which he's just sort of been bombarding um, with his uh, fleet. Uh, and uh, then he, uh, finding not surprisingly, that's not the safest place for him, he eventually ends up at the court in Istanbul um, by the end of 1689. And this creates a problem uh, for the Ottoman court uh, because basically he's persona non grata with the Algerians and the Ottomans desperately need the Algerian naval help in large part uh, because the Venetians have taken over almost all of the Peloponnesus in Greece by this point and they're starting to threaten many of the Aegean islands held by the Ottomans. So they want to immediately put Mesomorta in charge of the fleet as the chief admiral. But the Algerians basically send back uh, messages to the Sultan saying, you know, this person is a criminal, you know, they've engaged in all these criminal acts. Um, you know, we're not going to tolerate this person any longer. Um, and so to smooth things over, the Sultan sort of, uh, you know, quietly banishes him from court but assigns him to the Danube River region and Black Sea region instead as a way of sort of hiding him from view. And in 1690, Ottoman archival records begin to start uh, popping up, uh, basically uh, showing Mesomorta uh, being assigned uh, various uh, grants of ships, men, and material to aid in the war effort in the Balkans. 
And in particular, this particular record dating from 1690 seems to show that Mesomorta was instrumental in the logistics of the Ottomans retaking uh, Belgrade uh, from uh, the Austrian-Hungary uh, army uh, in 1690 um, by uh, supporting it with various kinds of men, material, and shipping up the Danube. And shortly thereafter, he begins to start rebuilding what had up to this point been a clearly deficient Ottoman naval force that had had little to no impact in being able to stop the incursions of the Venetians and others um, on their uh, territory uh, in uh, the 1680s. His first assignment was in fact to begin uh, trying to do the same thing for the Mediterranean that he had done for the Danube and the Black Sea, which was to open up shipping lanes to Egypt to bring men and material to defend the Eastern Aegean islands of Crete um, and others from uh, predatory Venetian uh, attacks on the fortresses there. Um, and uh, he very quickly moved to uh, bring various kinds of uh, Egyptians, especially those who could be armed with various kinds of long rifles and uh, cannons, uh, to the theater of war. Uh, and he basically was able to prevent the Venetians from retaking parts of Crete, which was a very real fear uh, by the early 1690s. But the Ottoman records also show some very real tensions uh, with the grand admirals that the Ottoman uh, sultan had appointed to the post. And the tension basically stemmed from the fact that Mesomorto, as we've seen, is a real sort of sailor's sailor, right? a corsair, very experienced in naval matters, while the grand viziers that were appointed to the chief admiral position um, were often instead people who were favorites of the court and often had only very limited uh, naval experience and often relied heavily on subordinates um, of sometimes limited uh, talents in their own right. And so the response of these grand admirals was basically to be very conservative and to not risk the fleet in any kind of meaningful engagements. Uh, whereas Mesomorto's first response was, I can beat these guys. Let me go out and go after them. And this creates all kinds of tensions. And we find uh, documents in the Ottoman archives where the Sultan is literally ordering his Grand Admiral and Mesomorta to cooperate more fully to try and uh, block further Venetian advances, uh, suggesting that these conflicts were leading to uh, negative outcomes. And in fact, interestingly enough, one of the Ottoman chronicles notes an incident where one of these grand viziers actually had Mesomorto, uh, you know, imprisoned in 1692 for several days under the pretext that he was, quote, selling ordinance to the infidels, uh, end quote. Um, and, uh, you know, for three days he languishes in a prison in, just outside the city walls in Istanbul, um, and then the grand vizier who does this, luckily for him, is deposed by an order of the sultan for an unrelated reason. And then the Istanbul uh, military governor comes to the uh, uh, prison, basically lets him out and says, you know, we don't need this. We need this guy on our side. Um, and I didn't have any knowledge of this or I wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Um, so he's promptly released and then sort of sent back to sort of continue his activities. But these tensions really persist until around 1694 and 1695, when the Venetians become bold enough to launch a major offensive against the Aegean island of Chios, which is just off the coast of the mainland Turkey today, near Cheshme and Izmir. And in the process, the Venetians were able to basically conquer the island of Chios and establish a garrison on it and thereby threaten the entire shipping lanes running along the Eastern Mediterranean between Istanbul and Egypt. And true to form, the Ottoman Grand Viziers chose to be conservative and to say, well, we've got to defend the Straits, we've got to hold back, we've got to make sure they don't get any further. 
And at that point, Mesomorta got so angry that he mutinied against the uh, Grand Viziers and basically says, no, this is too critical. We have to go and repel this invasion now. And he took half the fleet and sailed off to basically confront the Venetians in the seas off of Chios. And the upshot of all of this was that because Mesomorta only really had half the fleet and the Grand Vizier sort of only very grudgingly trundled along behind him, uh, the Venetians very quickly bottled up Mesomorta's fleet in the Gulf of Izmir, and the only thing that probably prevented the uh, destruction of the Ottoman navy at that point was that other European re representatives in Izmir basically told the Venetians, don't come in here and bombard the navy, or they're going to plunder us too as a punishment, and then we're going to hold you responsible. So the Venetians decided to be satisfied with simply, uh, you know, repelling the Ottoman navy and bottling it up. And at that point, the Sultan got so angry with his Grand Vizier over this that he seems to have sided with Mezzomorto finally, and basically deposed the Grand Vizier and said to Mezzomorto, um, you know, look, I'm putting this uh, uh, guy Amjazada Hussein Pasha in charge. He's a friend of yours. He'll let you do what you want to do. Um, please find a way to deal with this. Uh, and Mezzomorta then did. Um, he armed substantial amounts of men from the Turkish mainland uh, and then uh, launched a seaborne assault against the Venetians off the island of Chios and succeeded in defeating the Venetian Navy in February of 1695. Uh, and uh, basically at that point, uh, he was appointed the head admiral of the Ottoman Navy um, and his patron Amjazada Hussein kicked upstairs to a higher position. And for the remainder of the conflict, he would basically be the primary naval representative. And over the course of the next three years, Mezumorto Hussein Pasha, in a way that's been insufficiently placed into the historical assessments of this conflict, basically forced a Venetian retreat from the entire Aegean region and eventually bottled them up in the region of the Greek Peloponnesus and the islands immediately off the coast there. Um, and the chroniclers at the time basically state how that it was not until Mezumorto Hussein Pasha took over the fleet that the Venetians actually started to respect Ottoman sea and military power once more. And probably the only thing that prevented Mezumorto from uh, 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 defeating the Venetians outright by the end of the conflict was the fact that the Ottomans lost the land war in Eastern Europe. And by 1698, the Ottomans were suffering from such critical fiscal problems that Mezumorta had to open up his own uh, savings and his own money to pay his own sailors to prevent them from mutinying and abandoning the Navy in 1698. Um, but ultimately, his uh, contribution was to restore the Ottoman Navy as a uh, sea power to be reckoned with. Um, in the Mediterranean, despite the overall defeat in the conflict of the Great Turkish War. So let me wrap this up by offering a few reflections on Mezumorta's legacy um, in all of this. Um, in part due to his first critical victory over the Venetians, uh, in 1695, when he returned to Istanbul to report and to restock his fleet for the next round of campaigning, this is when he endows these funds for the Nasuhi Sufi order um, in Uskadar and elevates this to sort of a major religious presence in the community. And in his own words, he said, the reason I won that battle is because I saw Nasuhi Effendi appear on the prow of my ship and basically lead us to victory over the Venetians. And it's because of this that I am offering my unconditional support and allegiance to this Sufi order. I am forever your indebted follower. Now, Nasuhi Effendi, for his part, was flabbergasted by this. 
Uh, and in the accounts that we have, he basically says, you know, look, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I wasn't there. You saw something else. It wasn't me. Maybe it was some other saint. And Mesomorto was like, no, it was you. I know it was you. Um, you know, it, it was definitely you. Uh, you, can, you can deny it all you want, but I know when I know. And uh, so despite, you know, Basuhi Effendi being flabbergasted by the whole thing and unable to piece it together, um, he did ultimately use the uh, funds granted to pay off the order's debt, um, make it into an important spiritual center, um, and uh, it would remain so uh, up until the last of his descendants um, uh, 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 passed away in 1934. Um, this all being said, there's still the thorny question of why he did it. It may well have been that he just legitimately believed this, or that his sort of deep Sufi ties in places like North Africa led him to sort of recognize these figures as kindred spirits. But there may also have been some political reasons to it as well. Um, his general enemies at court uh, tended to side primarily with more puritanical religious movements um, uh, that tended to not be particularly friendly to Sufis. And by building up Sufi orders, a figure like Mesomorta may have had the agenda of sort of creating countervailing forces in the political and social arena of Istanbul. He also established certain key traditions um, in that, uh, uh, especially in the latter years of the war and thereafter, he would always parade the fleet around the sort of Bosphorus Straits in Istanbul and perform various kinds of public shows and cannonades that sort of entertained the Sultan and his court, and indeed the general public, um, especially around the area of Tophane, um in the north. And uh, people apparently really got into this and uh, they would even have sort of pleasure trips for the sultans and the grand viziers, which were sort of a way of propaganda to get them to better support the Navy and demonstrate why naval matters were important. And this accelerated when his patron Amjazade Hussein Pasha was elevated to grand vizier in the most unfortunate of circumstances, when the former occupant of the office was killed at the disastrous Battle of Zanta um, in uh, 1697, which basically guaranteed Ottoman defeat in the long Turkish war. But as part of this offensive of charm, you might say, he prepared a naval guide known as the Kanuname, which is basically sort of an instruction manual for the kinds of ships that the Ottomans needed to maintain as a standing navy, the amount of resources and sailors that needed to be provided for all of the ships. And it basically advocated that, you know, in order to have a successful naval presence in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, you needed to maintain this level of ready forces as part of the Ottoman budget and infrastructure. And the Kanunami proved very influential throughout the 18th century. Um, and in fact, uh, seems to have guaranteed an uh, Ottoman stasis in naval matters up until the latter half of the 18th century. There were no further major incursions on uh, Ottoman uh, naval uh, sphere of influence until the Russo-Turkish War of 1768 to 1744, or 1774, I should say. And even there, Ottoman defeat was probably conditioned more on the rebellions of their own vassals in Egypt and the Levant uh, than on a, uh, a complete Russian uh, victory of arms. Mesomorta eventually dies in 1701 um, after the war had been concluded. And fittingly, he is buried in the main town in Chios, um, in the Muslim cemetery. Um, I was not able to find his grave when I went there some years ago, but uh, uh, the Ottoman records make it very clear that he had died and was buried on Chios. And there's actually a document that sort of announces his death and uh, trans uh, transfers the uh, resources that were under his uh, control and command uh, to his uh, successor, who was a man named Abdul Fattah Pasha. Uh, 
Um, and uh, uh, the amount of resources and money was in fact quite uh, uh, significant and Mesomort uh, clearly uh, controlled a good deal of uh, resources uh, by the time of his death, showing his importance to uh, the Ottoman uh, system by this point. Um, given that the Venetians had not really been fully defeated, it's tempting to sort of view this as uh, a missed opportunity. Uh, but a decade later, a successor uh, of Mesomorta, a man named Johnam Hoja, who had a very similar background to Mesomorta, right down to the captivity uh, by uh, enemy forces um, in the 1680s, um, used Mesomorta's tax tactics and um, his kanuname as a guide uh, to pave the way for a final Venetian defeat and their expulsion from most of the Peloponnesus. And uh, from that point onward, Venetian naval forces were no longer really much of a factor um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we can, to a great extent, credit Mesomorta for uh, creating the conditions and the infrastructure uh, that allowed for a final defeat and ultimately a marginalization uh, of Venice uh, from the Mediterranean theater. Um, and uh, this often gets lost in the sort of broader Ottoman defeat that marked the end of the 17th century. Um, so with that, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, wrap this all up um, and uh, thank the various uh, sponsors who gave me funds to do the kind of, you know, exacting research to unearth all of this stuff um, in the form of the Fulbright Scholarship, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Research Institute in Turkey uh, was especially instrumental um, in providing funds and support um, for this kind of a project. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I'll conclude with that and turn things back over to the moderator for uh, questions, comments, or anything else you'd like to do as a, a learned society. Well, well, thank you very much for an absolutely beautiful presentation. Uh, so clear, and so it was it, you know, the, the, the way that you brought his life, or his life to life, in such a, but nevertheless, in a scholarly context, was really absolutely wonderful. So, 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 so thank you. Um, that, that, that re really remarkable. Now, what we should do is is try to unshare the PowerPoint so we can go back to people, um, people's, people's. Um, that's it to mute, um, meeting mode. That's absolutely wonderful. I mean, one of the. One of the obvious things is, 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 is the chap must have had nine lives. I mean, really, a, a, an ability to survive, which was quite incredible. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, part of the reason I just couldn't give this up, despite my better instincts, was the fact that, uh, you know, that, uh, how did this guy pull this off? I mean, this just really is, this is something somebody should really make a movie about someday because it really is extraordinary in every way. And uh, every time I've given a, a variant of this presentation, that's always people's reaction is, uh, you know, th th this is really sort of an extraordinary figure. And uh, you know, one of the questions that always comes up is how much could we really generalize from his uh, life and experiences uh, because to some extent he seems so extraordinary as to not represent anything resembling the norm at this time. Uh, my argument in response to that would always be uh, that you know in certain times and places he was very much a product of the forces that had created characters like him. And so if you uh, sort of don't look at it in the sort of full broad sweep um, and instead look at it piece by piece the way I've laid it out here, you can see how all these components really do sort of reflect the culmination of these naval trends in the Mediterranean of the early modern world um, and uh, sort of in some ways bring to an end the era of the Corsairs and the pirates by the 18th century. Yes, yes. I mean, the one, I see that there's a question from Lale, but just, just to say, um, the only, curious enough, the only pirate book I have ever owned, at least since childhood, seems to be very parallel. It was it was the one describing the life of Dugai Trua. I've never quite been, had to pronounce it to anybody, but he was the he was the French pirate who bashed up the British, went off and conquered Latin America, came back and, and wrote his reminiscences, 
um, which were then published against his knowledge. By that time, he'd become an admiral. I and mean, he was so cross that he got the first edition of the of the of the manu of, of the book um, abolished, and so he could actually publish a censored version of his own life. So he was able to clear up his early piratehood. Um, but by coincidence, that does seem to be parallel um, 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 to the man you described. Yeah, and I would I would love it if you would actually email me that reference after we're all done here, because one of the things I'm trying to do to maybe broaden this out a bit more is to look for these global parallels. I had mentioned this problem of piracy con uh, conference where I found, you know, people giving papers on examples of this kind of phenomenon in places like uh, the Maratha movement in the Indian subcontinent in uh, China. Um, there's also examples from the uh, Atlantic world, um, you know, along the lines you're mentioning here, uh, and, uh, you know, collecting these kinds of references so I can sort of examine them and, uh, you know, get a sense as to how they measure up with this particular narrative, I think would be extraordinarily helpful if you have them. Of course, no, that, that would be a great pleasure. Uh, Craig, has everybody's camera switched off? Uh, suddenly we've gone to a whole feast blank screen, or is everybody? Ah, great. Good. So, yes, a quest question, please. You're not Lale, but you're most, you're most welcome. Yes, yeah, so, so, so yes, yeah, so obviously uh, uh, this, this is Lali's computer, <laughs> so he, it's Ian Smith. So fantastic presentation, John, thank you very much. He was superb. Um, my interest is, is, is the Knights of Malta, so I'm sure we can find a parallel, a parallel Knight of Malta. But my, my, my question is, is, I've seen his name, uh, Mezzo Morta, I've seen his name in Italian sources as, met, as Mezzo Morto, as you say. So I take it Mezzo Morta, is, is that the... And I don't think that's the way, I don't think the Ottomans would have called him that, they would have called him Hussein Pasha. So what's, what's, what, what is this, the spelling that you're using? Is, is, is that, is, is it French or English or, or what? That's, that's my simple question. That, that is what they called him in Ottoman Turkish. Um, really? Every single document refers to him as Mezumur to Hussein Pasha. Really? Um, or who's Mesomor to Hussein Raiz before he becomes a admiral. Um, and, uh, you know, it's spelled with uh, the Arabic letters, uh, you know, M, Z, uh, a sort of a Hamsa that stands in for the second E, uh, and then a, another M, uh, R, a sort of hard T, and then, you know, another uh, A kind of sound at the end. It's always written as a morta. Um, they, they never refer to him just as Hussein because there's a lot of Husseins running around. And, uh, you know, they always distinguished him by this nickname, uh, which was actually, I think, fairly common in Ottoman circles. So every single document you've got, it's easy to identify him because, you know, it's such a unique combination of letters, you immediately gravitate to him and you're like, there he is. You know, it makes the researcher's life a little bit easier, actually. That's amazing because the, the parallel for that is is the name of the the sort of city smashing uh, cannon, the Baliames. He doesn't eat honey, which is apparently Italian uh, Baliamezza, middle sized cannonball. So, <laughs> so anyway, there's a, a, a short linguistic uh, observation there. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. That's <laughs> not fabulous. Not <laughs> at, at all. Yes. Good evening. Any questions? Do you have a question, Chidem? Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I'm sorry if I, um, because I came in late, I, I, I missed the beginning. How did you get interested in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, you say in push, I think. Well, it, it, it actually sort of recapped a bit at the end. Um, you know, I'm actually a scholar of Islamic mysticism and yes. Sufi writers. Yes. Um, so what led me into this rabbit hole was the fact that Mesomorta had endowed this, you know, otherwise very marginal Sufi group with an incredible amount of funds that sort of turned them into one of the major groups in Istanbul who are still, you know, these, these are, you know, the guys who helped depose the Janissaries in 1826. Yeah, yeah, they sort yeah, of yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the poor judgment okay. for this. Okay. Um, so I was like, well, why did this guy just abruptly come in and turn these people from sort of a marginal borderline starving group in 1694 to, you know, one of the biggest spiritual groups in, you know, the capital? Uh, and, uh, you know, the more I started trying to figure it out, the deeper the rabbit hole got, and then I ended up with this mess instead of what I was supposed to be doing. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, as I've been saying with David, uh, um, you know, it's just so fascinating and so unusual a narrative and a story um, that it just eventually seemed to demand a treatment in its own right. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's proven so popular with so many different audiences in the past year or so since I've started presenting the results um, that, uh, you know, it seems like this may have a, a bit of legs on its own and I can always get back to the good old Sufi stuff later. Um, that's not going anywhere in any case. Um, so uh, that that's that's kind of where I am. And in fact, one of the useful things you as an audience could perhaps do um, would be to maybe offer suggestions about what do you think I should do with this? Um, is this worthy of sort of a, a book length treatment? Um, is it better placed in sort of more of a series of short articles focusing on the various component parts? Um, you know, what is your reaction to, you know, the, uh, uh, the interest or the potential of this kind of a study in this figure? Uh, may I? Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Put it. If you can't find a publisher, I would go for a book. Mm -hmm. I definitely would. Um, it's yeah. not about finding a publisher. I think it would be wasted as an article or series of articles. Um, I would definitely go for a book. Um, and I, I think at the end of several years, because there's so much wonderful research now, um, about the Ottoman history, I think those missing links will tie up. Mm -hmm. These are the missing links uh, to me. I, I just read, a, read wonderful accounts of uh, Mahmoud Ali of uh, Egypt. Um, and so, I mean, th this is another part of the North, North African history. Wonderful. Go for a book. <laughs> yeah, well, it's tempting to because this is sort of ballooned. What's behind this is sort of a 20,000 word screed that sort of ballooned out of this as I've sort of been writing things down. And uh, well, I initially thought this would be a nice article that I could sort of you know, publish and then get back to business. You know, once it sort of morphed into this massive beast, I started asking a other questions. Um, now, the one thing that does complicate the matter, to be fair, is that my colleague, uh, Christine Eisenberg-Haren at uh, BYU, yeah. has sort of published a broader study of Ottoman Grand Admirals in which Mesomorta is sort of the final end chapter to that narrative. So I can't claim some sort of monopoly on him as a, a sort of scholarly project. Uh, but also, Christine sort of fits him into a much broader paradigm going back into the 15th century, um, uh, whereas I would want to focus primarily just on the implications of this figure alone. Um, so I think there's plenty of room for additional, you know, work on him, and I'd certainly be considering this um, in the future, um, because I think it has interest far beyond just Ottoman studies, which is, you know, yes. really, uh, um, my, my uh, a real question was going to, the other question was going to be, may I, uh, David, um, Knights of Malta. I mean, how um, does it, um, does it have more relations, uh, does it have more relations with the Knights in Malta? Mm -hmm. Well, John's I, order, that's what I'm aiming at. Yeah, my general sense is that the, the Knights of Malta are kind of like, in some ways, the mirror image of the uh, Algerian Corsairs. Um, right. You know, they're sort of the sworn enemies who are always capturing your people. Um, but as my colleague Joshua White has pointed out in recent years, um, you know, the Knights of Malta always had, um, you know, Ottoman Muslim judges in captivity. Um, who would actually help them to decide legal matters of, you know, how to exchange prisoners and things like this. So um, viewing them as sort of two hermetically sealed blocks is not exactly correct either. Um, there's always people, you know, imprisoned or, you know, present on both sides um, that serve as sort of facilitators for the various negotiations of prisoner exchange, ransoming, and, uh, you know, just sort of generally working out the, um, you know, in some ways we have to view this not just as sort of a war or a conflict, but it's also a business. People make a living off 
this. And you've got to eat first and foremost before you do anything else. And that's really in many ways the primary concern in all of this. And everything else is secondary in a way that we in our modern nation state environment don't always sort of look at it in this way. Um, but for them, this was about making a living. Uh, first and foremost. And if you don't do that, nothing else works. I mean, as Mesomorto found out in 1698, um, you know, if the state can't pay your sailors uh, sufficiently to keep them fed, um, you're going to have to open up your purse real quick, or you're going to have a real problem on your hands. And that's going to be the end of you too. Um, so, you know, this was a, this was really in many ways, their primary concern was what we would call logistics. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't, aside from the whole Picotti incident thing where the uh, day of Algiers sort of accuses these French travelers of really being in league with the Knights of Malta, and which was probably a spurious accusation, um, I don't find the narratives about Mesomorta terribly concerned with the Knights. Um, you know, his time frame is, seems to be much more concerned with the issues of the French, you know, both as an ally and as a opponent. Um, you know, it goes back and forth. He sort of starts out, you know, kind of as an ally in some ways. And, uh, you know, Laurent Darvaux basically says, you know, well, this is, this is not one of our enemies. This is one of the good guys. He's trying to work this whole thing out. And then later he says, well, he's, he's protecting our shipping. He's a useful asset and things like this. And then 10 years later, the French are shelling Algiers into the ground. So, um, you know, that seems to be his primary concern in his time and place. And the Knights, I just don't find a whole lot about them in his particular narrative, although I'm sure they're there. Okay. Thank you. Because um, in America, you may not be, maybe maybe you are, maybe you do know, but uh, Knights of Malta and um, Order of St. Joan or, um, is quite a thing in Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and uh, as, as I, I mentioned, Joshua White's work, you know, which, you know, he, he's done a lot of work on this. Um, and uh, the only uh, complaint I would have about it is he focuses primarily on this period from around 1550 to 1650. Right. And so inconveniently cuts off right when I need him to start. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the Knights actually, are, you know, play a very big role in all of this and you regularly come across idiomatic expressions in Turkish where you know you say uh, things got so bad for so and so that he was treated worse than one of the captives on Malta you know so uh, you know clearly there's a very real fixation in Ottoman uh, in, in contemporary Ottoman uh, uh, understanding you know they're, they're clearly viewed as the biggest naval problem that you don't want to run afoul of. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. That explains why they exiled the earlier opponents of the Republic to Malta. I never really uh, realized uh, that uh, before. Yeah, that's uh, a good, uh, good, how, good one. Good one. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how extraordinary. But as far as the book goes, of course, Noah Malcolm does a lot of the background, which is great for you um, uh, because, because um, you don't, well, I mean, because you can bounce off it. You know, in his book, um, uh, um, Agents of Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and uh, but that, of course, is the 16th mainly concentrates on the 16th century but, but this whole thing about a fluid a fluid dialogue between the um uh between the ottomans fighting the venetians the, the the way people cross between the two is absolutely the stuff of the, the stuff of the book um and um and that was published by penguin uh so so you know in your book is 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 your potential book is 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 just as interesting so it shows you that there is a potential mass market uh, for this, for, the, for, the, for this, for this, this kind of thing. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I would say it would be absolutely wonderful. And you can think of all the pictures and the etchings that that, that could be could be put in, um, uh, repeated and and uh, uh, and the, um, and really one one can think of be a, a marvelous a, a marvelous thing. Um, yeah, so I, I I think it could have a very very important place in our historiography. Um, but um, yeah. uh, ah, Ian has another question. Go, go ahead, Ian. I'm trying to start my yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it'll be a fantastic book. And then you imagine that just that this is the right period for costumes, the, the costumes, the, 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 the pistols, the swords, you know, everything about it. <laughs> it says Hollywood blockbuster. I just wanted to say, though, uh, um, 
I, I read somewhere that this 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 balanced warfare between between Malta, let's say the Christian states and the and the Muslim state, it was really driven by the need to have people to row these galleys. And given that mm. in Islam it was forbidden to to enslave any Muslim, you had to capture Christians simply to row the galleys. And obviously the, the, the Knights of Malta were operating on the same principle on the other side. And, and this, this finally started to peter out when Louis XIV decided to, uh, to, to send uh, criminals to the galleys, these galeriens, uh, you know, and, and sort of solve his own manpower problem for French uh, shipping in the Mediterranean. And this made, uh, made, made certainly the Christian powers less dependent on this, on this sort of slave uh, slave labour for, for, for rowing galleys, plus these square rigged ships, of course, that John mentioned, that, that, that started to come in in the in the sort of middle of the 17th century. I don't know what you think about that, John. This 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 balance of, of balance of terror really between the Christians and Muslims and uh, capturing and enslaving this this completely senseless war, and then having to ransom uh, you know ransom each other's people at huge expense. This this it was I think it was this this Louis XIV initiative that tipped uh, uh, that, that tipped the balance there. I don't know what you think of that uh, theory. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Ian? Um, uh, when chronologically did Louis the Fourteenth um, take this uh, step? Because this is an aspect I haven't yet considered, and it might well be very relevant. Um, do you know when he embarked on this? policy of uh, sending criminals rather than sort of captured uh, peoples to the galleys. You put me on the spot there because he did reign for, I think, 64 years. <laughs> so yes, yeah, it's not exactly easy about, to pin it down. about 1640 and 1714 when he yeah. died. I, I, think it, I, I, I think it was sometime around the time you're talking about, the 1670s, 1680s, would seem to be the right sort of time. And a, a number of things... A number of, I mean, because obviously you mentioned the Duquesne, but you had the Destfe as well. You had the British Admiral, whose name I forget, who also bombarding these these North African ports with these square rigged ships with bomb catches, mortars. And I think, you know, I think the, the, these are these are all things that, that sort of came together to put this this splendid era of piracy mm -hmm. to an end, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> along with sort of more, more boring naval costumes, all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I think we could probably find out for, when was this initiative taken. There was a, a policy put in place by the French Crown to send prisoners to the galleys, and I, I think the word galerien is, was used in French to mean any kind of prisoner long after people had stopped being sent to the galleys. So it was an important development, I think, in French uh, sort of French penal uh, and cultural history. But I don't, I don't really know much more about it than that. Yeah, because uh, Gillian Weiss's book, um, you know, which is largely about captivity and ransoming and things like this, um, you know, she makes it very clear that Louis the Fourteenth, during these conflicts in the 1680s, one of his primary goals is to not have to give back these galley slaves because he just needed them, and it was going to cause a real problem if he had to repatriate too many of them. So his whole relationship with the Algerians is sort of predicated on how little do I have to keep giving anybody anybody back in order to sort of maintain these treaty arrangements. And if this policy is sort of implemented in the wake of, say, the 1680s or something like that, it would go a long way towards illustrating how uh, the failure of this whole pointless Algerian-French conflict um, sort of uh, uh, you know, forced a rethinking of French policy in that regard, which is a whole other interesting aspect to the story that I otherwise wouldn't have considered. So uh, thank you for leading me down another rabbit hole, because uh, this sounds like it might be a, a useful one to pursue. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Look forward <laughs> to hear, hearing more from you about that. <laughs> yeah, well, this is why you do this stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you uh, you know, present it to enough uh, people out there and share, uh, swap ideas. You know, you, you it's amazing what you can get out of that. I mean, a lot of the stuff you see here is I just made an offhand remark and somebody went, well, well wait a minute. And, you know, next thing I know, you know, another piece of the puzzle falls into place. So mm -hmm. this is one of these projects because everything's so all over the map. You just, it really has to be collaborative in a way that's, you know, uh, unusually so, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a couple of questions which rather show my ignorance of Ottoman history? Um, but the first one is, is, is the, the dual meaning of the word dire is obviously terribly interesting. And I'm wondering how much that enters into popular discourse. Because 
Of course, in, in some in some Anatolian areas, there are distinct ways of using the word daya. Um, in an ordinary Sunni Anatolian village, it simply means mother's brother. Yeah. But amongst the amongst the Bektashis, daya means much more than that. Daya is a mark of respect you give to a holy man. And I'm wondering, uh, if that's congruent uh, with the social structure of the community, because um, these the, 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 the position of a holy mediator is, of course, um, in opposition to a patrilineal uh, organization. So you, it's not at all surprising sociologically that someone who's actually opposed against the the, 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 the patrilineal side, which of course is Amjad, should be called a Daya. There's a lovely opposition there. But nevertheless, why it should be a mark of respect among the Bhaktashi communities has, has nevertheless puzzled me. And I'm just wondering whether there's any slippage from the the, the, the use that you're, you've you learned about Daya into, uh, into Bhaktashiism. Is, is this at all possible? That's my first, mm -hmm. first question about Ottoman history. I'll come to the second one in a minute. Yeah, um, uh, hold on a second, let me try and look something up here. Um, there, there is, you know, in my bibliography somewhere, and I, it turns out the version I have up does not have the bibliography present, so um, uh, I, I, I can't really troll through the footnotes for it, but I can probably send it to you if you're interested later. Um, there was an article published about why this term bio was um, employed um, in this case, and it seems to have... Um, you know, been uh, uh, sort of a way of indicating somebody who was a guardian um, on behalf of somebody else. Um, the bio was sort of the traditional mm -hmm. guardian. If someone were to become incapacitated or unable to sort of manage the family business directly. And this is why um, the Algerians and others in North Africa began to use this term for these sort of local leaders who um, offered uh, uh, submission to the Ottoman Empire or in, in name only, really, as they sort of viewed themselves as the sort of uh, guardians who would handle uh, Ottoman affairs because the Ottomans were always too preoccupied to um, deal with them. And we have to keep in mind that because of the Crete War of 1645 to 1669, um, yeah, the Ottomans were, you know, completely knocked out of um, Mediterranean affairs for that entire period when these dayas start to manifest themselves, um, because uh, uh, basically the Venetians keep them bottled up. Um, in the, the Dardanelle Straits for almost the entire duration of that conflict. Um, and because the Ottomans are suffering from the fiscal constraints of the uh, 17th century crisis and the great Anatolian rebellions and all of these kinds of things, uh, they can never get up the resources to really break the Venetian blockade. And so they're just sort of bottled up on Crete and, uh, you know, in the, in the Dardanelles Straits for most of the conflict. And they're not really paying much attention to what's going on in places like North Africa to save if they can get this kind of assistance from them. And so this is why the whole idea of the Daya as the guardian or the guarantor in, the, in, 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 in a sort of a, a world where the sort of main person is incapacitated or unable to kind of act as a functionary uh, comes into play. And to sort of get back to the Bakhtashis, while I'm no expert in that particular order, my guess would be that it might have the implication that the, uh, uh, you know, the devotee of the Bektashi is clearly placing his, uh, his fate and his well-being into the hands of his sheikh as, as a guarantor. And thus the idea of the daya might apply in that kind of sense there as well. Um, but obviously I'm wildly speculating here and uh, you know, it's at best an educated guess. Mm -hmm. No, that's 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 really really fascinating. Oh, Ian, please. Yeah, I was just going to say linguistically. So, die or uncle, <clears throat> as a sort of stand-in for a parent, it's just the same with veli or vali, governor. So, guardian, the the, the governor of a province is, is the guardian, presumably operating on behalf of the father. The son. So, may, maybe it's just one of those linguistic things in Turkish. The the word pops out well, of that way of thinking. Well, it, that's a very good point. A bit more than that, because of course the other word for for, is is Hajibek Tashveli, 
you see that's what they call him so so you get the you get the dire um idea there being reflected in yet another word it must be more than a coincidence i, I shall um i shall investigate this next time i'm in turkey so you're right you know John, you, you say that talking about these things sets one off down rabbit holes well i think that you've just found one for one 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 one, one for me um but go ahead you're going to say something else um please I mean, yes, one, one will have to look into this, actually, and I, I will, too. Uh, remember the word, the Yolan Mak? The fortress. <laughs> it's, it, it's the verb from Dayu, but there is no verb, Amjalan Mak, you know. Yeah. No, no. Well, Kabadaya, of course, is a very common yeah, that, that there is a Kabadaya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, yes, yes. Kavadai is, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, oh, there's a Persian word as well, which uh, I just forget now. Well, they even had a conference on this idea. Oh, they have a very similar idea of, of a kind of a, an, a, 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 a forceful, a forceful figure. Um, mm -hmm. But the word has just escaped my mind now. Um, but does anyone else have another question, um, please, for our, our speakers? I don't want to be monopolising. Um, so please, please just jump in now if you would like. Otherwise, I shall ask my other question about the sociology of the Ottomans. But uh, go ahead. All right. Well, I'll go ahead then while people, whilst people are thinking. So, I mean, I think it's it's a lovely idea that he supported the Sufi order because of the, protecting his family and completely plausible. But are there other reasons as well why somebody who was basically fighting abroad would want to have the support, the absolutely unfailing support of a Sufi order in Istanbul? I mean, isn't it possible that, that for example, uh, he uh, needed somewhere to deposit his money? I mean, it's very, I mean, how, it's very, very difficult to look after your wealth if you're fighting a battle overseas. Um, I don't know how at that time one would uh, 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 be absolutely sure that it wasn't going to be confiscated. So he could have said to them, look, I'll leave you a thousand gold ducats you can have half of them so long as when i get back from overseas i find the other half waiting for me uh, is that is that kind of thing possible at all maybe that's not at all you know, it's sociologically plausible i in this case i do not think so um mm -hmm. and i would offer two pieces of evidence in support of that um uh the first is that uh you know the general practice of the uh shabaniya sufi order uh, that uh, uh, this uh, gentleman was a part of is uh, that ideologically you uh, do not uh, accept wealth from grandees and keep it. Um, you immediately distribute it to the less fortunate. Um, you know, and in this case, you know, obviously they paid off their, uh, their debts and uh, sort of made sure uh, that the order's institutions finances were in order. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, then they, uh, you know, it would probably have been distributed to the followers to build the support network. And I, so I think the support network in this case is more important to a figure like Mesomorta um, than, uh, you know, uh, safeguarding his wealth. I mean, he seemed to have no problem accumulating wealth. His death uh, notice, basically, he's holding on to, you know, half a million akcha. Uh, which are silver coins. Um, that's not chump change. I don't think he was worried about you know, uh, uh, bankruptcy in any meaningful sense. Um, uh, that all being said, uh, the other piece of evidence I'd offer in support is that I've found documents in the personal archives of the Nasuhi order um, outlining uh, their uh, vakuf holdings, um, their, uh, uh, you know, their pious foundations. And uh, they basically clearly used a part of the order's endowments to buy up properties that they then could rent or charge various kinds of rents on, ranging from public fountains to um, orchards to properties and rooms for rent, um, uh, that then sort of continually generate, generated, you know, pious income uh, for the support of the order and its activities. And it, it had a library, a mosque, uh, you know, eventually a tomb complex for the founders, um, and a cemetery that's still there that needed to be maintained. And so there was this whole network all scattered throughout various districts in Istanbul that all generated revenues for this um, 
you know, set of endowments. Um, so clearly the wealth was invested into the sort of future well-being of the order in a way that allowed it to persist uh, right down to even the years following the abolition of the order. Um, the last document in the order's library dates not from the 1920s when the orders were abolished, but from the year 1930, when the final sheikh deposited one final document into the order short, order's library shortly before his death. Um, so th this is a roundabout way of saying that I think, uh, you know, Mesmorto wasn't concerned about his own wealth um, as much as I think he was interested in building this kind of a support network, um, which, um, and given that Uskadar was in close proximity to one of the major uh, imperial ports that he was in charge of, there was probably a method to his madness, although frustratingly, I couldn't probably tell you exactly what it is at the current juncture. Thank you. Thank you. A any more, any more questions for our, our speaker at all? Well, in that case, I think we just have to thank you for really an absolutely marvelous presentation, one of such scholarly clarity that we will we will always remember it. So, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, oh, you're you're welcome. I enjoy having given it. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Thank yes, you. You're, you're, you're yeah. welcome, and thank thank all of you for uh, coming and uh, your uh, suggestions, which were uh, quite helpful indeed.